Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Nellist, and this week I'm joined by Green Left journalist, Lero Earl, and we'll be taking you through the latest activist news from Australia and around the world. If listeners haven't heard of Green Left, it is a people-powered media project that has been running for more than 30 years. We centre the voices of activists and provide an alternative to the corporate news media. You can become a supporter today for only $5 a month at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Before we begin, we acknowledge that this podcast is recorded on stolen Gadigal Wangal land. This land has never been ceded and always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. New figures from the Parliamentary Budget Office show that the Stage 3 tax cuts will cost at least $313 billion over 10 years, a huge increase on the old figure of $254 billion. The Coalition Government introduced the Stage 3 tax cuts, but Labor has supported them all the way. The Australia Institute, a progressive think tank, has released data showing that the majority of workers will be paying more tax in 2025 than they are now, even with the cuts. Only the richest will benefit from the tax cuts. There is growing pressure from unions, socialists, greens and some economists and commentators to scrap stage three. But Albanese and Treasurer Jim Chalmers are resolute they will stay. On to some XR actions in Melbourne. Climate is another area where Labor governments, federal and state, are following in step with the coalition. To combat this, Extinction Rebellion Victoria organised three days of action in Nam, beginning on May 25, with a series of workshops, a scooter and wheelchair ride through the CBD, the following day and a canoe sailing action and a march of hundreds through the CBD on the 27th. The protest was very lively with costumes, drummers, a giant bee and a huge koala half skeleton emitting smoke. The rally heard from various climate activists as well as Greens leader Adam Bamp and Jacob Andrew Arthur from Socialist Alliance. And in New South Wales, more than 30 people took action outside fossil fuel company Empire Energy's annual general meeting in Gaddy or Sydney on May 30 demanding that the company stop its plans to frack the Beetaloo Basin in the Northern Territory. Traditional owners do not want coal seam gas fracking on their land. On to NAB Human Chain, National Australia Bank, or NAB, are one of the banks funding the fossil fuel companies that are causing the climate crisis. A recent report by Market Forces found that NAB funds more more coal than any other bank. In response, Move Beyond Coal organised a human chain of about 100 people in both Mianjin and Gaddy outside NAB branches. There are some great photos on the human chains on the Green Left Facebook page you should check out. A few weeks earlier, climate activists in the Drum Rebellion in Sydney staged a theatrical demonstration against the state's harsh anti-protest laws that were introduced last year. Dressed as prisoners, they trudged through the Sydney CBD in single file, tied together with chains. Richard Bolt, who was a climate activist arrested at the rising tide protest against coal in April, told Green Left that the laws have emboldened police to make frivolous or underground arrests and spread fear among the people about protesting. Yeah, there is massive concern about the anti-protest laws in New South Wales, but the South Australian state government is following along, introducing its own draconian anti-protest laws on May 18. These include fines of up to $50,000 and three months jail for simply obstructing passage in a public place. A thousand strong rally was held by unions and community members against the new laws on May 26, and another took place on May 30 when the bill passed the Legislative Council. SA Union said the anti-protest laws are a massive overreach and a mess of outrageous consequences, quote unquote. Yeah, it's really important that we protect the right to protest all around the country or actions like what the Western Australian firefighters took on May 24 could be cracked down on. Um, So there was 500 firefighters who are members of the United Professional Firefighters Union, WA, dressed in their protective gear and marched to Parliament House chanting, fire and rescue, flames and smoke, your wage policies are a joke. Um, The union's taking industrial action for a pay rise and better conditions, but the WA Labor government has refused to agree to any of its claims, despite months of negotiations. Station officer Pippa Williams, who addressed the rally, said that firefighters' wages and conditions were falling further and further apart, and she pointed to the difficulty finding staff, with many firefighters having to work extra shifts to ensure stations are at full capacity, which is dangerous both to firefighters and to the general public. Also in WA on May 27, climate and anti-war activists rallied in Walialo or Fremantle to call on Labor to fight climate change and not war. By funding nuclear subs for $368 billion, it makes it very hard to fund real action on the climate emergency. The protest was organised by Stop Orcus WA and Walialo Climate Action, 
and speakers said that global military expenditure last year reached a staggering 2.24 trillion and the world's militaries are responsible for approximately 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The forum organized by the Refugee Action Collective on May 29 in Nam heard from Jordan Silverstein, author of Cruel Care, A History of Children at Our Borders, as well as three child refugees. The three child refugees spoke about their difficulties with finding work and studying without permanent visas. One of the speakers, Hussein, was only 11 when he arrived on Christmas Island with his family, but he and his family were transferred to Manus Island where he was physically and mentally abused. Now he's in Australia on a bridging visa, but is unable to get a job because of his visa status. The struggle for fair wages and conditions at university continues, with staff at Federation University in Ballarat protesting on May 27. Management's pay offer is well below others in the sector, with staff not receiving a pay rise since 2021. Dr. Jane Boag, who is one of the NTEU delegates, told the rally how wages and conditions of staff are the learning conditions of students. It's likely there will be more rallies with no resolution of negotiations in sight. Yeah, and it feels like we always have a lot of bad news on the podcast, but here's some exciting news. Um, after an independent councillor on the city of Geelong council resigned, it looks likely that Socialist Alliance member Sarah Hathaway will be elected as councillor. Hathaway received the next highest vote after the retiring councillor in the 2020 elections, and she told Green Left she's ready to commit to the role. Quote, I'll only be too happy to work with the people of Windermere for the rest of the council term. She said she is committed to fighting against the council's proposed budget cuts, a campaign that she's already been part of, and she wants to make and she wants to make community meetings in the Windermere ward a top priority. Now let's hear what is happening around the world. Transgender people in the U.S. are under attack. The far-right, white nationalist, anti-abortion, anti-LGBTIQ Republican Party has intensified its targeting of trans people, passing 51 bills in 18 Republican-controlled states that block access to gender-affirming health care, ban books and educational resources, and include stopping teachers from mentioning sexual orientation or gender identity. There are a whole heap of other areas where trans people are being targeted, and elements of this hateful discrimination are being imported across the world by far-right and anti-LGBTIQ groups. These attacks are part of a broader attack on all LGBTIQ people, with homosexuality still a crime in many countries, and it's only mass movements in the US and here in Australia that won important laws and freedoms for LGBTIQ people. So these movements need to build strength to stop these gains from being rolled back. Yeah. A trove of secret US government documents from the CIA and the Pentagon have been leaked online, revealing secrets about how the US is striving to re-establish its hegemony by targeting rivals, including Russia and China. While media outlets have refrained from publishing the documents under fear of US government reaction, they have reported on what is within the documents. The documents show how the US is intervening in Russia's war against Ukraine, de detailing the role the US military is playing in supplying weapons, orchestrating plans, and providing data. They also show that Ukraine is in a bad position with issues such as running out of ammunition, a real problem. The leaks also contain information about deals with South Korea, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates negotiations with Russia and Taiwan's lack of military preparedness. The documents were leaked by 21-year-old Massachusetts Air National Guard member, Jack Texera. Some more bad news from Latin America is that Chile's far right will have significant control over the writing of the country's new constitution. Scrapping the previous Pinochet-era constitution and writing a new one was a key part of the mass uprisings in 2019. But in its constitutional elections on May 7, the far right had a significant win, gaining 23 councillors. The Constitutional Council is responsible for drafting the new constitution, and it's a big loss for the Chilean left who will have to figure out how to face the strength of the right. More from South America as well. Uh, Ecuador's right-wing president, Guillermo Lasso, dissolve the country's parliament on May 17 and will rule by decree for up to six months until elections are held. Lasso claimed that dissolving parliament would solve the, quote, 
political crisis and internal commotion that Ecuador is enduring, unquote. But it was actually a last ditch attempt to avoid his impending impeachment for corruption and embezzlement. The corruption allegation centers around Lasso's brother-in-law, Danilo Carrera, and involves contracts between state-owned oil transport company, Flopec, and private company, Amazonas Tanker Pool. Parliament commenced impeachment proceedings against Lasso on May 16, which were widely predicted to succeed. Lasso was backed by the army and police, who promised to suppress protests. Lasso was incredibly unpopular, with 81% supporting his removal, but the US was quick to support the failing regime, as Lasso's neoliberal, anti-working class policies are beneficial to them. On to Spain now, and the governing Spanish Social Workers Party, or PSOE, who are a social democratic party, perhaps equivalent to Labour for Australian listeners, suffered major losses in Spain's municipal and regional elections on May 28. It lost five or six of its nine regional governments and 11 of its 25 provincial capitals. It looks likely PSOE, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, will lose the general elections originally planned for December. So he's called the dissolution of the Spanish Congress and for elections to be held at the earliest possible date, likely late July. Green Left's European correspondent, Dick Nichols, wrote that one of the key factors behind the PSOE downfall was that left-wing voters didn't come out to vote, particularly in Catalan areas. The other element is the collapse in support for Unidas Podemos, the PSOE's minority partner in the government. The far-right Vox party increased its vote, as did the right-wing People's Party. There will be more detailed analysis in Link's International Journal of Socialist Renewal at links.org.au. Last episode, we reported that the Turkish elections had to go to a second round after neither candidate received enough votes to win. But now the second round has taken place with incumbent dictator Recep Tayyip Erdogan re-elected president. The result sent a wave of dread and concern through democratic circles and the large Kurdish minority. The elections were unfair and the victory of the ruling Justice and Development Party in alliance with the fundamentalist Free Cause Party poses grave danger to Kurdish people who are already oppressed by the Turkish government. A series of raids and violent arrests in the Kurdish majority southeast of the country took place after the result with police reportedly breaking windows and doors and inflicting beatings, including hitting people with the butt of their guns. The pro-Kurdish groups were forced to run as the Green Left Party in the elections when the People's Democratic Party was banned from running. Timor-Leste voted in a new parliament on May 21, one which will likely see the return of Janana Guzmao as Prime Minister. Guzmao's National Congress for the Reconstruction of Timor-Leste, known as the CNRT, won about 42% of the vote. 31 out of 65 parliamentary seats. Guzmao was the former leader of the armed wing of Fredolin, known as Falintil, and was Timor-Leste's first president between 2002 and 2007, and prime minister between 2007 and 2015. The hot issue of the campaign was oil and gas, and how this ties to Timor's economic future. As their petroleum fund, which functions as a sovereign welfare fund for the nation, dwindles, Timor must decide what to do with oil and gas reservoirs at the Greater Sunrise gas field. International oil and gas companies are currently unwilling to support it. Guzmel has backed the Tazimane project, which aims to process gas from the Greater Sunrise offshore fields on home soil, as opposed to processing in Darwin. And he sees this project as his baby, and the election gives him a clear mandate to pursue it. To find out more about this story and everything else we have talked about today, head to greenleft.org.au. Eco-Socialism 2023, A World Beyond Capitalism, is coming up on the weekend of July 1st and 2nd in Nam at Victorian Trades Hall. Green Left is proud to host Eco-Socialism 2023 and provide a platform for the voices of peace, justice and ecological sustainability that the corporate media consistently ignores. There is an incredible lineup of speakers, including Japanese Marxist Kohei Sato, Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe, Clifton D. Rosario from the Communist Party of India, Marxist Leninist Liberation, and heaps more. Honestly, the lineup is stacked. I really recommend going to ecosocialism.org.au to check out the full list of speakers, as well as the different panels and sessions that they were speaking at. You're not going to want to miss Eco Socialism 2023. Get your tickets today. Green Left runs on people power. We don't accept corporate donations or advertising, so we need your support to continue. 
It's only $5 a month to become a supporter and only $10 a month to get the hard copy paper delivered to your door. You can also donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund, which will help us make more content like this. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. Remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.